Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. Good evening, good evening, America. This is Michael Savage with the headlines of the day. More than 9,000 gallons of fuel to be used on Air Force One for your president's trip to the Everglades to lecture the world about Earth Day. Also in the news, liberals are attacking Scott Walker as he tries to protect American workers by putting a halt to the flood of illegal immigrants. Meanwhile in America, Obama continues to use his pen strategy going around Congress with more executive actions. From abroad, first halal sex shop to open in Mecca, you heard me right, a Dutch-German Sharia-compliant sex company is going to open a shop in Mecca the Saudi Arabian city considered holy in Islam. One last note, the German company was founded by former Nazi German pilot Bita Usa Rakamund in 1946. They're now in business again with their Arab friends, this time peddling filth. Headlines for the Savage Nation go on. Americans don't want more immigration and they're right, they're killing us. Obama is attacking Cuban workers by supporting the dictatorship. Susan Rice disclosed classified information Iran. It gets better by the moment. In a moment, we'll have some sound from Bill Clinton calling ISIS the most interesting NGO today. I'm not making this up. It seems as though Bill Clinton wants some business from ISIS. Listen to clip number one on the Savage Nation. Arguably the most interesting non-governmental organization today which proves the importance of inclusion by its shortcomings but is formidable is ISIS. ISIS is a terrorist organization, an NGO, trying to become a state. That is, they don't recognize any of the boundaries of the Middle Eastern countries as legitimate. They were all established, drawn largely by Westerners after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. In World War One. So now we have the President of the United States being a propagandist for Iran and Bill Clinton being a propagandist for the ISIS organization, legitimizing them, calling them an NGO, and saying they're simply not recognizing what the West created in the Middle East. It seems that the Clintons have no bottom to their despicable natures. It seems to me he's looking for a new contract. Listen to the next soundbite in the Savage Nation. When they go capture a place, they set up their own judicial system. They set up their own rulemaking. They set up, you know, whatever their social services are going to be. And the only thing is you can't disagree with them or they'll kill you, as we have seen. And sometimes they kill you. They, they will allow, just as the Ottomans did in the caliphate times, they'll, they'll allow a Christian or a Jew to live if they agree to pay a fine. Well, that sounds like what Obama does. Obama permits Christians and Jews to live if we continue to pay the fine called exorbitant taxes. This is the most shameful generation of politicians America has ever had to live through. Obama won't call the 1915 Armenian massacre a genocide, again placating the murderous Muslims who are now dominating the West. Bill Clinton calls ISIS the most interesting NGO today. Meanwhile, a brave man wrote a letter to Obama, a Democrat, a liberal, and a Hispanic at that. His name is Ray Flores. I'll read you his letter. Dear Mr. President, he writes, a decade ago I met you when I was a writer for the Chicago Tribune's Spanish language news daily OI, as well as a communications specialist with the Service Employees International Union, Local 1 in Chicago. He goes on. And he said, little did I imagine that one day I would be writing an open letter to you, a man who had actually given me a recommendation for my job with the union, about your deafening silence as Christians are systematically executed by ISIS forces that some say your administration has helped fund and support. Why, Mr. President, he writes, 
do you stand in silence and apathy as the horrifying news reports continue to make their way to us from independent news sources on almost a daily basis? In Syria, Egypt, and Ethiopia, the pillaging of entire villages and schools has taken place, and there's not a peep from you. Entire schools of children are being set on fire. Women are being gang-raped, and men are beheaded in front of video cameras for all the world to see. ISIS terrorists are mocking and laughing at us as they slaughter our Christian brothers and sisters of all ages. Are you telling me that somehow you aren't getting the same message we're getting, Mr. President? In Australia, several Catholic churches were torched and burnt to the ground. Had they been mosques, I have a feeling that there would have been some kind of official condemnation from the White House. When, Mr. President, will you come out and denounce these acts of terrorism and provide the necessary military aid to stop this genocide against Christians? In future generations, this will be seen as our generation's holocaust. And people will ask, what did President Obama do? It will be sad to say that the answer will be a resounding nothing. That is from Ray Flores, a gentleman, member of the Service Employees International Union in Chicago, and a lifetime Democrat who has more guts than the entire Republican Party put together. This is the Savage Nation. The phone number is 855-400-7282, but it gets even better. Not only did Bill Clinton call ISIS an NGO legitimizing their rape, their pillaging, and their murder, but it seems that Bill Clinton was reaching out for a contract to add more money to his library. But if you think that you have hope with Jeb Bush, you're mistaken. In the following soundbite, you will hear Jeb Bush saying that the NSA spying is a good thing. Listen to clip three. I would say the best part of the Obama administration would be his continuance of the protections of the homeland using, you know, the big metadata programs, the NSA being enhanced, advancing this, even though he never defends it, even though he never openly admits it, there has been uh, a continuation of, of a very important service, which is the first obligation, I think, of our national government is to keep us safe. This is Jeb Bush calling for the spying on all Americans to keep us safe. It doesn't get any worse than this, does it? Yes, it does. It gets much, much worse than this. If you're foolish enough to take the bait and vote for this imposter, who, by the way, I called Barack Bush yesterday, then you don't deserve a nation. And now it's time for some calls to the Savage Nation. The phone number is 855-407-282. I have a slight caveat for you today. Once again, we had the plane drop from 45,000 feet of cruising altitude to almost hitting the ground just before airtime. Comcast went down. I have people on the street trying to talk to a crew of morons who are apparently playing with the wires that lead in and out of my studio from wherever I may be up to New York and out to the satellites to your local station. If I should lose you, it will be temporarily. There will only be a few minutes, I can guarantee you, because I'll have someone's head on a plate. Now let's take some calls on the Savage Nation. Any topic is fair game. Let's go to WABC in New York. <clears throat> Mike, excuse me, you're next up. What's on your mind? Yes, Dr. Savage, I just want to ask you a question. Do you think that uh, Governor de Blasio's statements about wealth distribution is just another word for communism? Yes, and the word progressive is the new word for communism, right. Anyone who is a progressive is, by definition, no different philosophically from the Bolsheviks who caused and brought about the Russian Revolution of 1917. Progressives are communists. Wealth redistribution, communism. Fairness, code word for communism. Don't fool yourself, my friends. They're out to turn you into a serf. Any other questions at this time? Or is the answer sufficient? That opens up a line at 855-400-7282. How do you feel about Jeb Bush saying that the best thing Obama has done is snooping on all America with the NSA spying program? Do you feel Jeb Bush is qualified to be president? Listen to clip three again in case you were uh, not listening, in case you listen to talk shows to tell you that Jeb Bush is the best thing uh, since George Bush. Listen to clip three again. I would say the best part of the Obama administration would be his continuance of the protections of the homeland using, you know, the 
big metadata programs, the NSA being enhanced, advancing this, even though he never defends it, even though he never openly admits it, there has been uh, a continuation of, of a very important service, which is the first obligation, I think, of our national government is to keep us safe. Now, Hitler would have said it another way. He would have said it by screaming and yelling, and they would have played the horse vessel song behind him. But it would have been the same words of Hitler, saying that we're going to spy on all of you Germans to make sure that the communists and the Jews don't undermine the state. But when it comes from a nice American Christian, someone with a friendly, deep voice, with a fairly friendly name named Bush, why you moronic idiots called Republicans think it's just fine. But let me tell you something. Hitler is Hitler, no matter what form it comes in. I'll be right back. It's the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Welcome to uh, Earth Day, ladies and gentlemen. In honor of Earth Day... God is sending us snow and rain in parts of America, including West Michigan. But it's a chilly morning out there. 35 degrees before sunrise today in West Michigan. But that didn't stop your leader, President Obama, from flying out and blowing out six to 9,000 gallons of fuel to give a talk uh, in Florida about the dangers of global warming. He won't call the 1915 Armenian Massacre a genocide, which is a fact, while he calls weather changes, which are perfectly normal, global warming, which is not a fact, because he himself is an artifact. He's an artifact of the office of the presidency. We have no idea what's going on, do we? I'm a fan of the television show called Homeland. I've watched too many episodes to think that it's all fiction. If you haven't watched it, it's really basically a simple plot. An American soldier gets captured in Iraq. He's kept uh, in captivity for seven years. He's beaten to the point where they break him. They turn him into a Muslim. They make him a double agent. They release him back into America. And this ex-American uh, soldier runs for office, and naturally he is elected because we love our war heroes. Meanwhile, he continues to pray to Mecca every day on a prayer rug in his basement, unbeknownst even to his wife and daughter. Meanwhile, he plots terrorist acts in America while he is a U.S. congressman. The one CIA agent who is on to him is convinced she is crazy by the other members of the CIA who put her in a mental hospital and subject her to criminal uh, drugs and criminal uh, electrotherapy. Uh, but she was right. He was a double agent all along. We have double agents operating at the highest level of American government, according to people who are in the intelligence services, uh, let us say formally in the intelligence services, who see what's going on right in front of their eyes. There is no other explanation for what we're witnessing. ISIS rampaging without any American, let us say, real vociferous opposition. Bill Clinton calling ISIS a non-governmental organization and justifying what they're doing in a roundabout manner. Jeb Bush saying that NSA spying is a good thing? Do you have any idea what I'm talking with you about? It's called penetration. It's called penetration. It's called ta the taking over of a government from within. So what's coming next is the question. Let's take some calls and see what America has to say. Let's go up to New York City. Stephen on WABC, fire away. You've got the floor. Michael, thank you for reading that, that open letter. And... Um... I applaud him for having way huge cojones than any rhino Republican, um, that, that, uh, without a doubt. Um, but he's, he's only, he, he's still only seeing 50% of what's going on because everything he was complaining about, uh, Obama not taking action on in, in his letter that he wrote, it, all those things were done intentionally by Obama and his administration. And, uh, and, you know, more right. what, what this gentleman, Ray Flores, the Democrat member of the SEIU, is saying that Obama's not acting during our generation's Holocaust against Christians. And he's saying in future generations, people ask, what did President Obama do? will be sad to say that the answer will be nothing. What you're saying is he's wrong. He did everything he could to make sure the Holocaust went on. Exactly. Is that what you're saying? You're alleging that 
Obama is openly aiding and abetting this Holocaust against Christians? Stephen, are you hearing me or not? I, I don't think he's hearing me. All right, I, we have another breakdown. Uh, there we go. WJJF in New London, Connecticut. Brian, you're on the Savage Nation. Fire away. Thank you for being our voice of freedom, Dr. Savage. I, I have a, a, a couple liberal, liberal friends, and uh, I have them convinced that there's something going on. I'm not a huge conspiracy theorist, but I listen to you every day. You put the pieces of the puzzle together, and there's no other conclusion to draw than he wants this stuff to happen. He's doing absolutely nothing, nothing at all. I have three little kids. They're going to grow up in a, in a weaker country than we have now and a president that is doing nothing. Well, here's the question. Why would he not say that the Armenian massacre by Muslims, the Ottoman Turks, killed one and a half million, starved them to death, raped them, murdered them, cut their heads off, gouged their eyes out, uh, pushed bayonets through babies. One and a half million Armenians were massacred. Obama, during his campaign, said he would make sure that the world didn't forget this, and this is the 100th anniversary of the killings this week, and yet... Obama will not call the Armenian massacre, by the way, the Armenians are Christians, a genocide because he wants to placate uh, the Turks. What is that all about? How can you justify a thing like this? And the same reason the Fort Hood shootings was a workplace violence incident and not a terrorist attack on our country. This president needs to... Well, speaking about the Fort Hood massacre, why is the perpetrator still living? Why is Major Nadal Hassan still alive when he committed this, these atrocities in 2009? Timothy McVeigh was executed within a few years, wasn't he? Absolutely. He absolutely was. And this is, this is another terrorist attack, but we have a president, a leader of the free world, that is, is refusing to call acts of terror terrorist acts. It is unbelievable. All right, so you would believe that not only is he looking the other way, he's actually acting on their behest. You go that far. I go that far. He goes that far. He goes that far as to say that there's an open penetration of our government by a Shia Muslim bloc inside the White House. How do you like that? Shows you how crazy some people are. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. And less violence uh, uh, around the world today uh, than there might have been 30, 40 years ago. Um, it doesn't make it any less painful, but, uh, but things can get better. We just have to be vigilant and we have to have strong partners. Meanwhile, Christian churches are being burned to the ground. Whole families are being raped and set on fire. Christians are being driven out of the Middle East. Yazidis are being driven out of the Middle East. And this lying double agent of ours called the president has the audacity to go on MSNBC and says, nah, there's less war and less violence. I'm doing a great job. I'm doing just a great job. Meanwhile, everyone who is in the military who knows better knows that he could have taken ISIS out within a week. But we're not doing that, are we? There's an actual calculation of how many impotent actions he has engaged the military in against ISIS, which is why they continue to rampage on their blitzkrieg. Do you understand that? WABC, John, welcome to the program. What's on your mind? Go ahead, please. Okay, I'm going to tell you right how I feel why this guy put these warships out in Yemen. It's a big diversion. People think he's there for other reasons. He strictly put them there to intimidate Israel in case Israel decides to attack Iran and blow up those nuclear silos. That's why they're there. Well, that's an interesting one. I don't know why he would send warships to Yemen since uh, he's on the same side as Iran. I mean, we're, Iran has become our ally in Yemen. Yeah, exactly. So why would he send war? How could he? How could, what are the warships for? They don't seem to be to fight uh, the Iranian proxy army. Are, are, is that what they're there for, or what? They're there strictly for Israel. In case Israel tries to attack Iran, that's why they're there. And if they're not going to attack, he's there to intimidate them. It's a message. That's the only reason. Why do you? Why? Where, what made you come to this conclusion? I feel, I know, I mean, everything about what he's been doing over the past couple of years is all opposite of uh, what we stand for in America. So I, I know everything he does is wrong. Everything is backwards. Everything is for a purpose. It's strictly to destroy everything. 
You know what's interesting to me is that there's an article on CNN by a man who copied my line, Aaron David Miller. He says, how I ran out Fox is the U.S., but he's actually ripping off one of my lines. He says, we're playing checkers on the Middle East game board, and Tehran's playing three-dimensional chess. How many times have you heard Michael Savage say that over the last few years? At least a dozen times. Is that correct? I'm sure. I've only been listening for a few months. So uh, what you've been saying is what... Uh, well. Yeah, well, yeah, they're playing chess, and we have people who are also playing chess. This is where they got it wrong. We're not, Obama's not playing checkers against their chess. He's playing chess against the American people. Obama's playing three dimensional chess against the American people and checkers against Iran. That's the real answer here, John. Exactly. Thank you for the call. 855 407 how do you feel about Jeb Bush sticking up for the spying on all Americans? How could you accept that? How could you accept a man saying that and claiming he's a Republican candidate? In another age, he would have been verbally tarred and feathered for this by the conservative media. But because the so-called conservative media is so owned by the Republican National Committee, including the Rush cartel, and I'm sick of it. I'm not holding back anymore. Rush Limbaugh and his cartel is owned by the Republican Party. They put him in power. They keep him in power. And that's why Jeb Bush gets away with it. The Rush cartel was created by the Republican National Committee, which is why he sounds like such a lying oaf. I don't care anymore. I'm not going to hide this anymore. The Rush cartel is owned lock, stock, and barrel by the RNC, which is why they support Jeb Bush which is why they support the ice cream man Rubio and the other insignificant candidates. It's why we're in trouble, because there's a one-party system. Since 1994, when I began in radio, I have told you we have a Democrat party running America. Or sometimes it's a Republican party running America. I told you this was an oligarchy in 1994. Has it changed? Only now it's more naked. In other words, they would have hidden it a few years ago. They don't even hide it, do they? WMAL in Washington. Uh, hey, Mike. Please don't don't ever insult me by calling me that man's name. I'm just playing with you. Um, what's the breaking point? How long can we go on this path with the elitists running everything till we have to say enough's enough? Why do you call them elitist? I don't like the word elitist. Why do you apply the word elitist to a bunch of low-life, double-dealing, backstabbing, anti-American carpetbaggers? Why call them elitists? I agree with you. It's just a term that a lot of people identify with them. Yeah, well, it's the wrong term. The word elitist gives them some dignity. There is no dignity in a person being treasonous or traitorous. No. And the entire Republican Party is treasonous or traitorous. They're engaging the same policies as Obama, as evidenced by Jeb Bush's statements. So what do the Americans... Have you heard one Republican, can have you heard one Republican candidate stand up and say the words, borders, language, and culture in their campaign? Has Ted Cruz uttered those words? No. No, he hasn't. Has Rand Paul uttered the words borders, language, and culture? No, why not? That has been my definition of how a nation is defined. Borders, language, culture. Can you name one nation on earth that does not define itself by borders, language, and culture? Even the despicable Hitlerites in ISIS claim that their border is what they want it to be. Their language is Arabic and their culture is Sharia law. They know what borders, language, and culture is. We, the Americans, are so weak so broken, so drugged, that we don't even recognize that we have been infiltrated and taken over by enemies of our own freedoms. They're the enemies of our borders. They're the enemies of our language. They're the enemies of our culture. What do they have to do until you wake up and say, no, I'm not voting for any of the above. I'm not voting for any of the Republicans. I will not vote for Jeb Bush. I will not vote for Rubio. I will not vote for Cruz. I will not vote for Rand Paul because they're all repeating the same party line. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Meanwhile, the tsunami called ISIS hangs over our head. The head of the FBI three or four weeks ago said that sleeper cells exist in 49 of the 50 states. The very next day, your president, 
disinvited him from a conference on terrorism. That's right. The head of the FBI was disinvited from a conference on terrorism because he dared say the truth, that there are sleeper cells in 49 of the 50 states. Your president, your double-dealing president, your Sharia-friendly president did not invite the head of the FBI because he dared tell the American people the truth. There's only so far we can go in our discussion. I was one of the people who said, hold your nose and vote for the Republicans last November. I admit it. Remember when my book was coming out, Stop the Coming Civil War? Well, Obama has been on a civil war against America from the day he entered the political scene. You say, wait, Savage, where's the civil war? You're living through it, idiot. Obama's engaged in a, in a social civil war against this nation. That book was prescient. That book was quite prescient. 855-400-7282, FTL in Fort Lauderdale. Tom, welcome to the Savage Nation program. What's on your mind? Yes, sir. Regarding Jeb Bush's holding to uh, NSA spying on Americans, this is, he's faithful to the entire Bush family tradition of supporting dictatorships, going back all the way back to Prescott Bush. His grandfather. Oh, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with you. The liberals were arguing against George Bush till they were blue in the face. They were arguing against the Patriot Act. Do you remember? Yes, I do. I do. And okay, I... so now we wake up and Obama expands the Patriot Act, and we say that's terrible because nobody wants to be spied on. And now we wake up and there's Jeb Bush glorifying the very same despicable anti-American Patriot Act. Yes, sir. And Obama is just an extension of the Bush operation right so Ob obama is not really an anomaly is he no he's not no obama is a stooge of the very same powers that run the world some say it's the bilderbergs they like the name because it sounds foreign and it sounds jewish and it sounds like jewish bankers but actually bilderberg is a reference to a place not a person and it's a reference to a christian place not a jewish place but i don't want to bore people who are nazis with the facts they like the word Bilderberg because it sounds like a conspiracy. But there are only a few people running the whole world. You know that, don't you? And it's all about profits. It's only about profits. It's all about profits, day and night. Isn't that true? Financial interest. Yes. Yes, financial interest. That's right. If I have to describe the United States today, I would say that it is a nation that has been infiltrated and it is being run by enemies of our freedom but more specifically, enemies of our borders, language, and culture. That's irrefutable. And I want to move you to another area right now without getting too agitated. Countdown to Mecca is the most brilliant novel I've ever written, and it's coming out in three weeks from St. Martin's Press. This is not a self-published book. This is by the most important talk show host in America, Michael Savage. And Countdown to Mecca is the last of a trilogy of novels. I will not write another one. I will not write another Jack Hatfield novel. That's it. The first two were really good. They were bestsellers. They're set in San Francisco. They've got the color of the streets. This is the best one of all with the best plot. And it's all about Iran getting the nuclear, the nuclear weapons that Obama's trying to give them. And there are characters in it that I've never used before. It's set in Israel, San Francisco, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. It's set in many places. I'd like to read some of it to you maybe tomorrow. There's a lot in here about the Mossad working with the U.S. military to bomb Mecca and how Jack Hatfield hears about this plot and works feverishly to stop them from this crazy plot, knowing that it would set off World War III. It's a good book, a really good book. And I highly recommend that if you're interested in military affairs, if you're interested in conspiracies, if you're interested in just a good read, that you take a look at Countdown uh, to Mecca, my new novel. Countdown to Mecca, New York Times, they're selling author of A Time for War. I, I'm not in the mood to read from it right now. I've had too much stress today. And uh, the stress was mainly electronic, nothing else. Systems failures five minutes before the show yesterday. Systems failures today. Uh, they take their toll on a human being, and I can only do so much in one day. Meanwhile, I'm here, stressed out as can be. It's okay. I'm not complaining. It's just part of the business. But here's a good, a good little piece for you. We're set in Israel now, 
in countdown to Mecca. It's set at the U.S. radar station at Mount Karen, Israel. And I want to read to you about one of the military characters that I wrote into the book. It'll take a minute or two. It'll entice you. Colonel Tristan Ashlock was not a lunatic by any means. Now, he's the guy who's plotting to blow, blow up Mecca. He was not criminally insane or pathological in his views of the world. He was an ardent American patriot who had spent his entire adult life wearing the uniform of the United States Army. Every male member of his family on his mother's side had worn that same uniform, dating back five generations to the Civil War, all of them graduating from the Virginia Military Institute near the top of their classes. Not one of his line had ever graduated at the very top, however, until Tristan did so in 1977. His great-great-grandfather, William J. Smith, had been on the verge of doing so when the Commonwealth of Virginia voted to secede from the Union in the spring of 1861. But this was as close as anyone else with his blood had ever come to matching the achievement. Upon leaving VMI to fight for the Confederacy, the young lieutenant, William Bill Smith, had served briefly under General Bernard E. B. before both were killed in action on the 21st of July at First Manassas. In death, Bill Smith left behind a pair of infant twin daughters, Eleanor and Sarah. It was from Sarah's line that Tristan Quentin Ashlock would emerge four generations later as the youngest of four sons, his older brothers all destined to give their lives either in the jungles of Vietnam or in clandestine military operations carried out during the Cold War. Their deaths, along with Tristan's genetic infertility, had assured that he would be the last of Sarah's line. Such were the laws of primogeniture. Today, Colonel Ashlock was 57 years old, with thick gray hair that he still wore closely cropped to his head. His penetrating eyes were the color of steel dust, and though his facial features had begun to sag a bit, he maintained the distinguished chiseled visage of the handsome warrior he had once been. He was a veteran of both Gulf Wars, the ongoing debacle in Afghanistan, and the recipient of the DSC, the Distinguished Service Cross. Though his service career had been well distinguished as a commander of troops in the field, he had made some socially critical errors during his climb up the chain of command, errors in the form of failing to keep his mouth shut at the appropriate times and failing to kiss the butts of the appropriate generals when it would have been prudent to do so, thus giving offense in all of the wrong military circles at all of the worst times. And I go on. Now remember who he is. He's a chief character in this plot in Countdown to Mecca. If you're a member of the military or you know someone a member of the military and you understand that all of my characters are drawn from real life, you'll understand that I had to use a novel in order to get my message out there. Do I have to spell it out for you any clearer? I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. So I'm giving out free copies of my, uh, my forthcoming novel, Countdown to Mecca, to everyone who gets on the show today. But I want to read one more paragraph from... Uh, the novel, and it's about Tristan, the general, who's plotting to blow up Mecca. And here's why. I'm trying to lay out the groundwork. The upper echelons of the United States military, from the president down through the entire general staff, had forgotten their collective duty. They had grown soft and indecisive in their misguided desire for peace at any cost, satisfied to let the tide of Islam slowly envelop the world. How many Middle Eastern governments would have to fall to Muslim extremists before America's leaders woke up and realized the folly of their so-called peaceful ambi ambitions. And now it looked as though Syria would be the next. General Ashlock believed that something bold and decisive had to be done to cauterize the growing malignancy of Islam. And since no one in the upper echelons of any Western government possessed the resolve to take this action, it appeared that he would have to do it for them. Do you understand what I'm doing here? Do you know why I wrote the novel? because it's not only one minute to midnight, it's 10 seconds to midnight, which is why I wrote Countdown to Mecca. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage.
And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. I am going to still go to Kenya. Look, uh, it, it's a heartbreaking situation. There's a lot of uh, tumult and, and chaos around the world right now. Uh, and part of our goal as the world's leading superpower uh, is to work with partner countries uh, to try to resolve conflicts, to be ruthless in going after terrorism. Uh, but we're not going to do that by ourselves, and we're not going to do it just by deploying uh, more Marines in every country that has these problems. If we had this man in office in 1939, you would be speaking German or you would be a lampshade. Welcome to the Savage Nation. Everything the man says is a lie and a cover-up. Now, I don't want to turn the whole show into Obama bashing because it's too easy to do. And we are at one minute to midnight or is it one second to midnight with the penetration and the infiltration that we all could see plainly in front of our eyes. Speaking to the issue of the uh, blitzkrieg that ISIS is conducting almost uninterrupted by Obama. There's a great article in there entitled Waging JV War by Michael Fumento in today's New York Post, and it's worth reading. You see, he fought there, and here's what he wrote. As Iraqis fight to repel ISIS in Ramadi, the O administration is deeming this vital city expendable. In so doing, the White House shows it understands nothing about the value of Ramadi, or even its own capacity to defend it. There's no better example of U.S. incompetence in dealing with these mad jihadis. Why isn't this key western Iraqi city, the capital of Anbai province, high on our priority list? According to Joint Chiefs of Staff Martin Dempsey, it's because President O would rather place the emphasis on defending an Anbar refinery to protect the oil supplies, as if we couldn't do both and then some. For the past eight months, the administration has settled for little more than jabs when it could have landed flurries of punishing roundhouse blows. According to the latest 24-hour Defense Department report, U.S. forces launched just 36 airstrikes against ISIS in both Iraq and Syria. That's actually much more than normal, but it nevertheless is the equivalent of fighter bombers from the offshore U.S. carrier making just one sortie a day, though each of these planes can fly several daily. And that doesn't count the vast numbers of ground-based F-16s, F-15s, F-22s, A-10s, B-1 heavy bombers, helicopters, and Reaper and Predator drones we have in the area, or the aircraft of 11 other coalition nations. The day before, there were only 13 airstrikes. Fewer than a single Reaper can launch on one mission. Cruise missiles are also in theater. Plus, B-52 and B-2 bombers can strike from anywhere in the world. Yet, with this massive armada and assets on the ground to help identify targets, the administration seems unable to strike more than a handful of targets a day, a machine gun here, a truck there. There's been little effort to translate success in pinpoint assassination efforts, such as that which last month may have temporarily knocked ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi out of the fight into a war-fighting effort, which brings us back to Ramadi, a city that's no big deal, says Dempsey. Quote, it has no symbolic meaning. That's an incredible statement, he writes. The city's meaning is both symbolic and strategic. During the second Iraq war, al-Qaeda in Iraq chose the city as its headquarters, and it became the most fiercely contested area in the country. That's why the author spent two of his three Iraq embeds there. It's why SEAL Team 3 of American sniper fame was stationed there during my embeds and yet again later. That includes the first SEAL killed in Iraq, Michael Mansour, who won the Medal of Honor for diving on a grenade. Many experts consider the Battle of Ramadi and the Anbar Awakening, engineered by Captain Travis Patrick Quinn, the actual turning point of the war. Patrick Quinn, who was killed in Ramadi along with my Marine Public Affairs handler, got the Sunni chieftains to join the Americans and Iraqi security forces to defeat al-Qaeda. Now those same chieftains and their brave men are being left to their own devices. Dempsey says that when we get around to it, we'll just take Ramadi back. Sure, like Saddam Hussein's hometown of Tikrit was retaken, one bloody meter at a time, as each trash bag, dirt mound, and corner hit an IED, and after untold numbers of the defenders were horribly murdered. In Ramadi, anybody who fought alongside us is slated for torture and death. Humanity aside, what kind of a signal are we sending potential allies? And he goes on. 
And he says this, that's why only about a third of Americans support his actions regarding ISIS, the lowest figure yet. And 65% of Americans think the war against ISIS is going badly. Michael Fomento concludes, he's a veteran paratrooper, by the way, who fought twice in Ramadi, once in Fallujah, and once in Afghanistan. He wasn't playing golf, and here's what he says. With monsters whose tactics would have made the German SS Blanche, who have aroused the ire of the Pope and even other terrorist groups, Obama is keeping America's arms tied behind its back. We're no sleeping giant. We're downright comatose. I would like to say thank you to Michael Fomento, but I don't think you have it completely right. We're not comatose. We have a president who's working for the other team. That's my opinion. It doesn't mean he's an active member of ISIS. It doesn't matter what the reason is. He may as well be a member of ISIS. It's as simple as that. 855-407-282. We are at one second to midnight. One minute to midnight is too far out. We're one second from midnight. According to the FBI, there are sleeper cells in 49 states. It's why I wrote Countdown to Mecca, a novel that will be out in a few short weeks. It will be my last commercial novel in this series. And the reason I wrote it as fiction is because there are things I had to say that I could not say in nonfiction. And that's why I created characters. And that's why I made it fiction. And everyone who gets on the show today gets a free copy of Countdown to Mecca. Now let's take some calls. KSFO in San Francisco. Joe, welcome to the program. Go ahead, please. Thanks for taking my call. I'm just wondering if... Rather than, you know, some, the Manchurian candidate thing, um, which I'm having a hard time buying into, if there's like st a strategic maneuver going on here with the U.S. government and the inaction against ISIS in that um, perhaps they want to let ISIS go ahead and form a nation state, if you will, the uh, caliphate they were talking about. And there could be a couple of reasons why the government would like that to happen. Now, what would be the reason? Why, why would you want Hitler to have a larger territory? I mean, would you let... Hitler wants to increase his his land because he needs a living space, so you let him invade Czechoslovakia and Poland? Well, one thing that I can think of is that any military, not just the U.S. military, but any military seems to have a difficult time um, defeating sort of loosely organized militias, guerrillas. What the U.S. military in particular is really, really good at is uh, combating a complete army with a homeland state. And well, they already have a homeland state. They defined it. It's called ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. They've defined their, their homeland. Right, but right. So you don't let them. Get, you don't let. Do you let them get stronger, or do you attack them while they're weaker? Well, I'm. You know, I'm. This is just a theory, but one. But thank you for that because that leads to the second point: is that the caliphate right now actually straddles a couple of borders. Right, there's a portion of it is in Iraq, and a portion of it is in Syria, and you know, it seems like there's a reluctance by the U.S. government from a political standpoint, not military, political standpoint, to make any incursions into, um, you know, other quote-unquote sovereign territories like Iraq, especially Syria, where, you know, there um, there's a civil war raging and the Russians are involved. Oh, well, we're all, well, hold it, sir. We are already in Syria. Special forces have been operating in Syria for several years now. They've been training the so-called opposition of fighters, mainly uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS, who are trying to topple Assad. The U.S. is in Syria. Everybody knows that. Anybody in the military will tell you that. They have family members in Syria. Everybody knows this. That hasn't turned the tide, though, has it? What would turn the tide is if there was a nation state that we could just roar an entire army into and basically take over like we've done before in Iraq, for instance. You're actually arguing the reverse of military strategy, and which I'm not a military man, but it's common sense. Do you allow a vicious enemy to grab a larger swath of territory before you take them on, or do you take them on when they're weaker? Well, it, you, 
you would think, right? I, I, I hear I hear your argument. You would think. However, um, you know, it doesn't matter kind of how big they get. And the U.S. military is so dominant, so awesome, that we could go in and take an entire country. Well, it's, why can't we take ISIS then? I just read you an article by a man who fought there who said we could have beaten them already. Why won't we beat them is the question he's raising. We, we don't need to let them take over half of Syria and, and, and a portion of Afghanistan in order to fight them. There's a fight going on right now. There are people fighting for their lives right now. We're not helping them. Right. And it's kind of Iraq itself is uh, the Iraqi government is fighting them right now. and We're not helping them. Right. And it's kind of skirmishes here and skirmishes there. But if you were able to just completely go in and take over an entire country like we have well it doesn't work that way a military doesn't go in and take over an entire country they they win it town by town they don't win it country by country even if you look at world war ii as an example it was fought in skirmishes building to building rubble to rubble town by town village by village and then eventually they reached munich and then the battle raged on so it was not done even in world war ii was not done in the way you're suggesting Sure it was when we took over. So, in other words, you're tr I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to rationally understand why Obama does not engage ISIS more uh, more directly. And you don't want to accept that he's on their side. You, you dismiss that as a conspiracy theory. And you don't want to accept that he's a pacifist because for some whatever the reason is, you can't accept that. And so you're trying to think that there's an actual grand strategy being uh, uh, that was thought out by the sorority that surrounds him that would explain what they're doing. I disagree with you. And the only grand strategy I can think of is that they're on the side of the Shias in Iran who actually wants ISIS to grow in power, even though they're allegedly fighting them. We can agree to They're all part and parcel. They're part and parcel. Let's not fall for the Muslim shell game of it's Shia versus Sunni, and one of them is our friend. Neither side is our friend. They both hate us. The Sunni and the Shia would like to see us killed. Don't you understand that? I do. They're not your friend. You can't do business with any of them. That's right. I believe that. That's my opinion. It's a shell game, and we're stupid enough to think that one side is on our side or less vicious than the other. So that's why I have to go back to fiction to make my point. In Countdown to Mecca, I left you where the general is plotting bombing Mecca. And, of course, Jack hears about it through something happens. I told you what it was. So he's in Israel now. And he's in a trailer, air-conditioned trailer, talking to his Israeli counterparts. And it's in this trailer, which is stationed atop Mount Karen. If you think I don't know what I'm talking about, listen carefully. Just five miles over the border from Egypt into Israel. He instantly felt the oven-like desert heat on his face as he gazed out over the Israeli terrain spread out far below him in all directions, reminding him how briefly, uh, briefly of the view from Masada. For the past year now, he had been the commander of a highly classified American-run radar installation with 120 American technicians and combat personnel under his command. The only foreign troops stationed on Israeli soil, their mission was to maintain a close radar watch on Tehran, 1,000 miles away to the northeast. The classified X-band radar they used to perform this mission was so powerful that it could detect a soccer ball kicked into the air from near nearly 3,000 miles away. In the event the Iranian government ever made the fateful decision to launch one of their Shabab-3 missiles at Tel Aviv, this radar installation would detect it within seconds of launch, allowing for effective countermeasures to be taken before the missile ever reached Israeli airspace. The Israelis' own radar would not pick it up for a full seven minutes, far too late for an intercept. So this significant time difference in detection made the American early warning system an invaluable asset to the security of Tel Aviv, as well as a powerful bargaining tool for the United States to use in curbing the aggressive natures of many hardline first strike advocates within the Israeli government. Ashlock got into his car and drove across the small base to the gate where he was passed through by a pair of American soldiers armed with M4 carbines. Within the hour, he pulled up to a large government garage used to house earth moving equipment. 11 miles south of the Negev Nuclear Research Center. He parked near three other civilian vehicles, all of them bearing either diplomatic or governmental license plates, and went inside. I'm reading from Countdown to Mecca, my forthcoming novel, for a reason. If you think it was just tossed off overnight, 
Well, you're mistaken. There's a lot in here you may want to know that I can't tell you in nonfiction. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. We're talking about why is Obama not fighting ISIS? Why is he just wrist-slapping them instead of crushing them? Some say it's because he's sympathetic. Others say it's because he's pacifist. Uh, there are many, many answers to the question, but there's no one arguing that he's not taking them on. He is not taking them on. He's not doing his job as commander-in-chief. He wants ISIS to grow. There's no other explanation for it. WABC, Sean, welcome to the program. What's your point, please? My point is we've bled enough. Um, I understand that... Uh, a lot of blood was wasted. I'm not going to say Obama was uh, is sympathetic. Okay, you're right. Nobody wants another war. We're tired of war. All of us are. And we cannot put Marines on the ground. Then why are we not sending them the mortar tubes that they need? You know why? I'm asking you. Here's, here's the question. Why are we not sending them the weapons they need to defend themselves against these, these scum? These low-life throwback scum! Why? Why are we not helping the people who are willing to die for the cause? You got me. Uh, I do not know. I well, you got, got you. I don't want to get you. I want people to wake up to the massacre that's occurring against Christians because of your president. You fall for the public relations because you're easily gulled. It's the Kardashian awakening in America. If someone has a large butt, you think they're beautiful. Let me tell you something. They could have been wiped out in the first week. F-16s, F-15s, F-22s, A-10s, B-1s, helicopters, B-52s, B-2s. Not one boot on the ground. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Explain something to you. You know, there have been some books in history that have changed the course of human events. I can name a few that I've read in my life. I, you know, one was about the meatpacking industry at the turn of the 1900s. <clears throat> it exposed uh, the filthy food industry. It, it brought us the uh, food safety laws. I forget the name of the book. I think uh, uh, Upton Sinclair wrote it. Uh, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, Changed the Mind of the Whole World. Just the title alone, Silent Spring. What was she saying? Pesticides were killing the birds, and we wake up one day to a silent spring. She started the entire environmental movement. And for those of you who don't understand the importance of it, I pity you. Don't assume that you say, here, the environmental, they're all wackos. I've spent a good portion of my life rescuing rainforests, etc., so I don't want to go into that. But that book woke people up. There are books that wake people up. I wrote Countdown to Mecca to wake you up to what's at stake in the world right now. Islam threatens to take over the entire world unless radical Islam is stopped. I, I as sure as I'm sitting here, they will take over the entire world because we have people on our side who are passive cowards or, 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 or overt operatives of Islam in this government. And I'm not alone in this opinion. Now, I've said this many times. I've alluded to it many times on the radio and in some of my books. But there are things that I want to say that I couldn't say that I do say in this book called Countdown to Mecca because it's fiction. But my fiction is based on good research. I'm originally a scientist, and I research things very well. And so I take you to Israel in the middle of the book, and I'm going to give you the germ of the plot. It's a group of generals, CIA agents, and Israeli Mossad who are plotting and arguing over whether to blow up is, uh, uh, Mecca. And I want to read you the germ of the book because you have to understand what's at stake here. So now they go down in a hangar and they get in there and they're in a uh, down below. Inside were six pensive looking men, four Israelis and two Americans. Both of the Americans were CIA agents in their 40s. Two of the Israelis were of the same age, both agents with the Israeli Mossad, but the other two Israelis were 10 years younger than the rest, both of them nuclear physicists working for the Israeli government. They were also brothers, 
though this wasn't immediately obvious to look at them, with one of them being orthodox while the other was clearly a Hasidic Jew with the curled side locks of hair hanging down in front of his ears. Both of them worked at the Negev nuclear plant where the entire world understood that Israel had probably manufactured close to 200 nuclear weapons since the plant had first gone online in the late 1950s. In the basement of the plant, several levels down, the Israelis also ran chemical and bacteriological weapons programs. These were launched in the middle 1960s when there was concern about the widespread destruction the high-yield bombs would cause, as well as decades of lingering radiation. Nerve agents, blood agents, and choking agents were produced here, along with disease agents ranging from anthrax to Ebola. There was a secondary reason for producing these other weapons. In the, even, in the event of an attack from any of its neighbors, the bomb runs would release these toxins and cause untold devastation in those border nations. Ashlock, now he's the general now behind the plot. Ashlock said, I take it we're all here then because we've decided to go through with this. One of the CIA men, a gruff-looking fellow wearing a Yankees cap with gnarled hands and a sunburned face, shook his head, jerking his thumb at the Hasid. Curly here's got cold feet. Watch your mouth, said the Hasid's older brother. He has valid points. The older brother was tall and thin, scholarly-looking, with a prominent nose and thick black hair. His name was Colton. The CIA man chuckled. His name was Chevrier, a former Navy SEAL from the first Gulf War. He glanced at his partner, a thinning, a thinner man with a hatchet face and dark, sandy blonde hair. Hear that, Parks? He's got valid points. Parks smirked and shook his head, trying not to laugh. If Chevrier was the muscle in their little CIA team, Parks was definitely the brains. The Jew Colton took a step around the table, but one of the Mossad men, another military-looking man named Laidlaw, with a shaved head and goatee, put a hand on his chest to stop him. You better grow a thicker skin, boy, or you're likely to get your neck broken. Ashlock stared at Chevrier long enough to make sure the CIA man felt the weight of his gaze, then turned to the younger brother, who stood looking defiant on the far side of the table. What's on your mind, Isaiah? Isaiah was the smartest man in the room at 29 years of age. He wore th wire rim glasses and looked like the classic Jewish nerd. The target is wrong, he said simply. Wrong how, General Ashlock asked wondering if he had judged the younger man correctly. The Jew said, destroying Mecca will leave no center to the Muslim faith, Isaiah said. The war will never end because they'll have no reason to ever quit. We'll have to kill every last one of them. Ha! Chevrier said with a little sneer. What's wrong with that? Isn't that the idea? No, it isn't, Isaiah said, matter-of-factly, pushing his glasses up onto his nose. The idea is to eliminate the extremist threat to the civilized world, but by destroying Mecca, you instantly turn every single one of the peaceful into another warrior extremist. You fill him with hatred and you force him to fight. It's obvious if you take a moment to think about it. It's a total war, a war of complete annihilation, Chevrier said, which is exactly what we want. Now remember, these are the conspirators planning to bomb Mecca in my forthcoming novel, Countdown to Mecca. And then there's a man who says, wait a minute, are you crazy? So Isaiah looks around the room. And he says, I can't agree to that. It's not a sound strategy. Look at it another way. If you want to control a man, do you murder his entire family? No, you murder one child and leave the rest alive, making sure he knows the lives of others depend on his cooperation. After that, he has no choice but to do as he's told. You can only destroy Mecca one time, gentlemen. After that, there's nothing left to threaten them with. You'll have to kill them all. And I don't think we can count on the Western powers to do that. There'll be too much guilt. They'll fight the war half-heartedly, just as they're doing now, and it will drag on forever, just as it has for 2,000 years. Chevrier grumbled, mumbling something unintelligible under his breath. Colonel Ashlock stood watching the others, his arms crossed, as he waited to see who would speak next. He had already decided what had to happen, but he was counting on one of the Israelis to do the actual dirty work for him. Laidlaw lit a cigarette, tossing the pack onto the table with a sigh. Listen, I understand your point, Isaiah, but there are no half measures with a nuclear weapon. You of all people know this. Otherwise, why bother to use it? We have to hit their biggest target and kill as many as we can, because after the war begins, the West will have to keep it conventional, and that means... Is that what you think, Isaiah interrupted? 
You honestly believe the already dangerously unstable Muslim government of Pakistan will sit on their own nuclear arsenal if Mecca is hit with a weapon of mass destruction? Allow me to remind you, after the remains are finally analyzed, the source of the components used to make the bomb will be traced right back here. Ashlock held up a hand to caution him. That's not necessarily so. Only the U.S. has the requisite data to trace the source back to Israel. Because nobody else even knows for sure you people have weapons of mass destruction. And the U.S. isn't going to release that kind of info to the Muslim world for very obvious reasons. The other Mossad man cleared his throat, speaking up for the first time. His name was Frank. And he looked more like a banker than a Mossad agent. Which site do you propose we hit instead, Isaiah? I ask because even hitting Medina feels like a half measure to me. You make the Islamists every bit as angry, but you kill maybe half as many? My problem is the mathematics of the thing. Isaiah crossed his arms, glancing furtively at his brother, before he spoke the words that he had agreed on the night before. I propose we hit the dome of the rock. You're insane, Laidlaw, blurted. Destroy one of our own cities? I'm going to pause right there. I wanted you to show, I wanted you to see what's in store for you with a book that's going to make you sweat and keep you up at night. Because sometimes fiction is the only way to get a message across. And the name of the book is Countdown to Mecca. I don't want to give the whole plot away. It's by Michael Savage, the best-selling author of A Time for War and Abuse of Power. And it's uh, the last in the Jack Hatfield series. I'm not doing them anymore. I don't have it in me, and I don't want to do any more of them. It's over. And you know why it's over? Because we're going to be over very soon unless somebody speaks the truth to what's going on in this world. If you think that ISIS is an anomaly, if you think Obama's inability or unwillingness to crush ISIS is a product of his passivity, then you, my friend, may as well buy a prayer rug and learn Arabic. The phone number is 855 I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. It is the Savage Nation. The phone number is 855 We're talking about the tepid war against the Hitlers of our time, the decimation or the genocide being committed against Christians, Azidis. We're talking about Obama not mentioning the Holocaust against the Armenians who are Christians. And many people are starting to awaken very slowly to his real sympathies. It takes a long time for people to wake up. Unfortunately, in our case, it may be too late. WMAL in Washington, D.C. Lee, welcome to the program. What's on your mind? Hi. How are you, Michael? It's so good to talk to you. I called in a, a while back, and I said it then. I want to say it again. You're an absolute genius, and I thank God for you, your thoughts, and what you're doing out there. Michael, we, we have the Trojan horse. We've let the Trojan horse in. We're being destroyed from within, Michael. That Trojan horse is Obama. He hates this country. He is a closet Islamist. His father was a Muslim. He sympathizes with everything he does, and he chastises Christians and everybody else from Israel and anybody else that are really our allies. He doesn't want anything to do with. He's letting in Cuba. He's negotiating with Iran as they're bringing arms to Yemen. When are people going to realize what's happening here? You realize it. You're letting us know it, Michael. But I've been saying it for a while. It's happening. You don't have any Muslim leaders coming out. They are so excited about the possibility of Muslims taking over the world. Like, well, wait, wait, Let's slow down. Most of what you said I agree with, but you must admit that uh, uh, Jordan is launching airstrikes against these vermin. Uh, Jordan is a Muslim nation. Uh, at last I checked, Egypt was a Muslim nation, the most populous Muslim nation on earth. And thank God uh, it's not in the hands of Obama's friends, the Muslim Brotherhood. They were fighting ISIS, so it's not completely hopelessly. No, it's not completely hopeless. But if you look at their human rights and you look at what they do to women there. I understand, but I mean, we got we got to have partners somewhere to fight these, these, these Nazis and headscarves, don't we? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, the big question is, why is Valerie Jarrett so important in the White House? 
And what about her Iranian connections? Everyone's buzzing about it. Uh, most Americans never heard of her, uh, but it's an important point. Lee, I have a question for you. Did you hear me read from my novel, the, the forthcoming book, Countdown to Mecca? Did you hear any of it? Yes, I heard all of it. It's and I want to ask you something. Did it strike you as based on reality? No doubt about it. It's happening. You are talking about reality. It's happening. People I'm sending you a fr I'm sending you a free copy to share with your friends. You'll get a fresh hardcover copy. The book will be out in a couple of weeks. Whether it sells or not, I don't know. I really don't know what's going to happen. You know, you write it, you talk about it on the radio, you hope people get excited by it. Why am I writing the books? Do you think I want to buy a Rolls Royce? Do you think I want to go on a yacht? Do you think I need another haircut? I do need another haircut. Actually, that's something I do need, but I can afford that. I let my hair grow too long. I'm starting to look crazy. I don't understand it, but I don't know what the hair thing is. But I'm not writing the book because I want to make more money. I'm giving money away. I'm giving away the scholarship money. That's only the beginning. I don't know how to put it to you. You know, every man has an in internal clock, and uh, everyone has a shelf life both professionally, metaphysically, biologically. And um, I feel that I had to say some things in fiction that I don't even dare say on radio. And I hinted at some of them in the novel I read from you today, Countdown to Mecca. I think there's a trove of information in the book that you'll say, where did he get this information from? It sounds too real for him to have made it up. Who are these characters? Do they exist? Uh, do they not exist? How would he have known them? Why is he even talking about it? What is he trying to say? And that's why the book was written. But it's a lot of fun. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, a novel has to be fun or else it's garbage. If it's just a diatribe, a political diatribe, it's not a good book. So I write about San Francisco, the restaurants, the streets. Teddy's in there. The yacht is in. The boat is in there. When I had one, I mean, it's fictionalized. The dog is not called Teddy. His name is Eddie. Those of you who came to love Eddie in the previous novels, Eddie's still alive. But my new characters are pretty good. I like Saul Minsky, the Jewish gangster who is helping Jack. And I like the character Anastasia, the Russian prostitute who has the eyes of an Arctic wolf. I love these characters. And fiction is interesting. Fiction may be the only way to get information out to the people. And it's a way to discuss ideas. And as I said to you, there have been books that have changed the course of human events. I wish I could remember the book that Upton Sinclair wrote about the uh, horrible practices in the meatpacking industry that led to all of the food safety laws around 1908 to 1910. I don't remember. Does anyone know the name of that book? I'll give you a free copy of my book if you know the book. What did Upton Sinclair write? You're going to look it up on Google now. That disclosed the, the horrors, the dirt in the, the meatpacking industry. Anyone got an answer to that one? That changed everything. It led to food safety laws. Silent Spring led to the banning of certain pesticides and awakened America to the dangers of the rampant use of chemicals in our environment. Books change things. Maybe Countdown to Mecca will save the world or awaken enough people to turn the tide against radical Islam. Does anyone know the name of the book? I, it's right at the tip of my tongue. I can't remember it. My, the Jungle, The Jungle. How would you just look it up on uh, on 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 Google, uh, Robert? He looked it up on the record. Oh, you knew the book. He knew the book. He knew it. it's a required reading. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair changed the course of human events. Uh, Silent Spring changed the course of human events. Uh, books do change the thinking of societies, and I'm hoping that you will read Countdown to Mecca and you'll talk about it, and maybe you'll awaken people who don't care about politics by giving them a a fiction book and say this is an exciting book and maybe they'll say wait a minute what is he talking about maybe they'll wake up to the fact that our entire military command structure is run by a bunch of old ladies who are in it for the contracts and the golf courses and maybe they'll see something about their their dear god obama that they won't dare admit join the savage nation call now 855-400-SAVAGE-SAVAGE Home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture.
And here he is, Michael Savage. Did you ever have such a bad day that it's... Okay, that's thank you. Bro. Did you ever have such a bad day that you start to feel good when it's less bad? Welcome to the program. I had such a rough day from so early in the morning that now that I don't feel as bad as I did an hour ago, I'm starting to feel that I feel high. It's an amazing feeling to feel bad for so long. When the sense of dread and doom starts to go away, you actually get a natural high when actually you're still very depressed and low. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the program. Look who's running for office now, Carly Fiorina. Can you believe this creature? I'd rather vote for a box of pablum than Carly Fiorina. I remember she ran for the governor of the state of California, and she was in favor of illegal aliens. She was no different than the rhinos running. I mean, she's... Carly Fiorina is Jeb Bush with lipstick, and I'm not so sure he wouldn't look better than her in lipstick and a dress. You remind me a little bit of Herman Goring on his night on the town and a night in Munich. 855 Let's go to some of the callers. Jeff on KFAY Radio. Welcome to the program. Jeff, what's on your mind? Yes, I, uh, I've been listening to you for over a year. Uh, you, one day I was listening, and you replaced uh, another radio host I thought was a good show. I thought I was listening to a quartet, or, and now I get to listen to an orchestra. But I believe your upcoming uh, fiction novel is going to be more important for people to read than they realize. Well, it has elements in it that go well beyond the face value, Countdown to Mecca, and I'm sending you a free copy, Jeff. Have you read any of the previous novels where I have Jack Hatfield as the hero? Have you? Ha uh, did you read Abuse of Power or A Time for War? Uh, no, sir, not yet. Well, you're going to read Countdown to Mecca on me. Everyone who gets on the show from now right through launch is going to get a free copy. KSFO, stay on the line, please. We're going to go to line seven now. Richard in my hometown of San Francisco on KSFO. What's on your mind, Richard? I think the book even if it does not have exactly the scenario that will play out, uh, makes people aware of how we are having a disconnect between our generals and, the, and our president and our administration and the Congress and uh, bad senators like John McCain. They're likely to give our own generals conflicting signals, our admirals, and there's going to be a mistake at some point. If we don't all stop playing Republican versus Democrat, Hawk versus Dove, we need to come out in the, as a nation especially the people on talk radio and the real thinkers, and unite with trying a strategy that will actually defeat the Islamists and leave the rest of the Muslim world alone. Well, Richard, do you agree with me that that is an important problem? It is an exceptionally important problem because... I think the one problem, I, the only problem, the supreme problem of all problems, the only problem that keeps me awake at night is the problem of... Radical Islam taking over the entire world in our lifetime. And, the only and I do not understand, I do not understand how stupid the average American can be. I'm watching the tsunami as it rises offshore. I see it rising to, to, to heights that are unimaginable, and it's about to hit us. And the idiots in this country don't say a word. You know, I studied the immigration problem ever since I began in radio in, in 2000 and, uh, I don't know, 1994. And although we've been swamped by illegals for a long time, going all the way back to uh, Kennedy, the drunk, who lied when he said that it would not change the demographics of America, do you know the immigrants that are coming in under Obama? Do you know where they're coming from? Do you know they're not primarily from Mexico? Are you aware of that, Richard? I have actually been blowing the trumpet and trying to warn people about if you bring in... Ten people that will work, and one person is a terrorist, you're losing the war because you're going to have terrorists all over the United States, and we won't know it if they all decide to attack on the same. Right. Well, well, take a guess where Obama is bringing them in from. He has altered the demographics of the immigrants that he is letting in, and they're not coming from Mexico. They're not speaking Spanish. The dominant immigrant groups that your president has chosen to flood America with are coming from the Middle East, from Africa, and from China. Did you know that? I absolutely do know that, because I have a friend who actually converted to Judaism from Islam, and we couldn't protect him. They actually grabbed him and threw him in a van and threatened to kill him if he didn't return to Islam. So even the Islamist Muslims... Well, that's why it's called the religion of pieces. See, the, the translation was wrong. We're told it's called the religion of peace, but it's actually the religion of pieces, P-I-E-C-E-S. 
Well, Salam in Arabic means conquest. It means conquering the whole world by force if necessary. Peace Islam means submission. Islam does not mean peace as Obama sells it. Islam means submission. Exactly. It and means submission. Okay, stay on the line. You know why I wrote the book, Countdown to Mecca. It's one second to midnight, and I'd like to send you a free copy of that book. Richard, thanks for calling from KSFO. Now let's talk about Obama's lies about Earth Day. Isn't it amazing that a hypocrite like he gets away with it? 9,000 gallons of jet fuel, AAA aviation fuel, to go and give a rotten speech in Florida. And While we're talking about Earth Day, it, it, there's a story within the story that's worth telling. And that is the story of the Cretan who started Earth Day, Ira Einhorn. Do you know anything about the man who created Earth Day? He was as big a con man as Al Gore. His name was Ira Einhorn. He was known as the unicorn killer. Look him up. He's the American convicted of the murder of his ex-girlfriend, Holly Maddox. In 1977, his girlfriend, beautiful woman, disappeared following a trip to the apartment that she and Einhorn shared in Philadelphia. She went there to collect her things. They were breaking up. Eighteen months later, police found Holly's body partially mummified in a trunk in his closet. It had been packed with styrofoam, air refresheners, and newspapers. After he was arrested, Einhorn fled the country. Now, you know who helped him get out of the country? A Philadelphia district attorney, then a Democrat senator, then a Republican senator. Anyone remember his name? He helped Einhorn flee the country because he was loved by the liberal establishment in Philly. And he spent 23 years in Europe protected by the liberal establishment, including the French, before being extradited to the U.S. because of one brave district attorney in Philadelphia. She kept after him. Einhorn took a stand in his own defense, claiming his ex-girlfriend had been killed by the CIA who framed him for the crime because he knew too much about the agency's paranormal military research. It was all a lie, of course. He was convicted and is currently serving a life sentence somewhere in America. His moniker, the Unicorn, came from his name Einhorn, which means unicorn in German. Now, what does it have to do with Earth Day? Ira Einhorn was an active participant in the first Earth Day event in Philly in 1970. He later claimed to have been instrumental in the creation of Earth Day and launching the event, but other event organizers dispute his account. Nevertheless, that's the man behind Obama's Earth Day plea on behalf of global warming, a day that he flew to Florida spewing thousands of gallons of fumes from Air Force One. Okay, what more do I have to say about that? WABC Paul, fire away, you're on the Savage Nation. Hi, Dr. Savage. Um, I just wanted to ask you your opinion on uh, that, but you, you just beat me to it. I just I saw it on the news this morning, and I just couldn't believe what I saw. He's going he's gonna to fly to Miami, and then his security detail is going to transport him to... Um, to the Everglades, so we can give a speech about climate change. You know, he's going to, he's going to, it seems kind of counterproductive to me. Uh, I just don't understand it. Counterproductive? How about a lying hypocrite who is an embarrassment for the world? Well, I mean, of course, of course. I'm not going to. 1,800 miles round trip, 9,180 gallons of fuel on Air Force One. How about that one? He's going to lecture us. How about that one? How, how does that work for you environmentalists out there? Do you feel good about having a liar and a hypocrite in the White House? Ah, he's actually a nice man. He's not a Muslim. He has a nice family. Ask John McCain. We had a chance to stop him. The man was never, ever qualified to be anything other than a community organizer. But I don't want to spend my time on that. He's going to come out here. He's here now. He gave a speech on rising sea levels, salt water seeping inland, threatening drinking water for Floridians, blah, 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 blah. Let me tell you something. As a person who has worked as a conservationist all of my adult life, which I have done so, I've done an awful lot of work rescuing rainforests, rescuing the folklore of rainforests. I, in fact, you don't know this part about me. I chained myself to trees back in the 60s to stop their destruction in places. Yes, I'm a certified, uh, not environmentalist, because that word has negative connotations, rightly so. I'm a certified conservationist. So there's no one more qualified to talk about preserving what God has given us and protecting animals than I. I've done it. I live it. I eat it. I breathe it. 
But the fact of the matter is, this man is a lying hypocrite from the get-go. He is not qualified to speak about uh, the environment because he abuses the environment every day of his life. That's the whole point. That's what we're trying to say to you. How the American people can put up with a fraud like this, uh, I, I, I just say, I should say, I don't know. I do know. All you got to do is, is say one word. Williams. Brian Williams. Brian Williams is not an anomaly in the American media. Brian Williams is the epitome of the American media. They're all Brian Williams. In fact, they should all wear a little button that says, we are all Brian Williams. Every last one of them is nothing but a talking skirt. A talking skirt or a talking suit. It's because of them that the country is wrecked. Now, many of you say, you know, come on, knock it off. The country's not wrecked. You know, the economy's doing well. It's relatively peaceful in the country. What are you complaining about, huh? Well, that's for those of you who are half blind and half deaf and half dumb. Those rest of us who actually have two eyes and a full brain can see what's going on. And we see the tsunami that is rising above us, the tsunami of radical Islam that will engulf our children and our children's children. And while you're at it, why don't you tell us about the debt that your president has put us in that can never be repaid by printing money. So you think things are coming up roses, do you? Well, when you use too much fertilizer, eventually you poison the earth. Printing money is the equivalent of using too much fertilizer. This is the Savage Nation. I'll be right back. Be here. Be Join nowhere. the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. The only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. I want to move you to another area right now without getting too agitated. Countdown to Mecca is the most brilliant novel I've ever written, and it's coming out in three weeks from St. Martin's Press. This is not a self-published book. This is by the most important talk show host in America, Michael Savage. And Countdown to Mecca is the last of a trilogy of novels. I will not write another one. I will not write another Jack Hatfield novel. That's it. The first two were really good. They were bestsellers. They're set in San Francisco. They've got the color of the streets. This is the best one of all with the best plot. And it's all about Iran getting the nuclear, the nuclear weapons that Obama's trying to give them. And there are characters in it that I've never used before. It's set in Israel, San Francisco, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. It's set in many places. I'd like to read some of it to you, maybe tomorrow. There's a lot in here about the Mossad working with the U.S. military to bomb Mecca and how Jack Hatfield hears about this plot and works feverishly to stop them from this crazy plot, knowing that it would set off World War III. It's a good book, a really good book. And I highly recommend that if you're interested in military affairs, if you're interested in conspiracies, if you're interested in just a good read, that you take a look at Countdown uh, to Mecca, my new novel. Countdown to Mecca, New York Times, best-selling author of A Time for War. I, I'm not in the mood to read from it right now. I've had too much stress today. And uh, the stress was mainly electronic, nothing else. Systems failures five minutes before the show yesterday. Systems failures today. Uh, they take their toll on a human being, and I can only do so much in one day. Meanwhile, I'm here, stressed out as can be. It's okay. I'm not complaining. It's just part of the business. But here's a good a good little piece for you. It was set in Israel now, in Countdown to Mecca. It's set at the U.S. radar station at Mount Karen, Israel. And I want to read to you about one of the military characters that I wrote into the book. It'll take a minute or two. It'll entice you. Colonel Tristan Ashlock was not a lunatic by any means. Now, he's the guy who's plotting to blow, blow up Mecca. He was not criminally insane or pathological in his views of the world. He was an ardent American patriot who had spent his entire adult life wearing the uniform of the United States Army. Every male member of his family on his mother's side had worn that same uniform, dating back five generations to the Civil War, all of them graduating from the Virginia Military Institute near the top of their classes. Not one of his line had ever graduated at the very top, however, until Tristan did so in 1977. 
His great-great-grandfather, William J. Smith, had been on the verge of doing so when the Commonwealth of Virginia voted to secede from the Union in the spring of 1861. But this was as close as anyone else with his blood had ever come to matching the achievement. Upon leaving VMI to fight for the Confederacy, the young lieutenant, William Bill Smith, had served briefly under General Bernard E. B. before both were killed in action on the 21st of July at First Manassas. In death, Bill Smith left behind a pair of infant twin daughters, Eleanor and Sarah. It was from Sarah's line that Tristan Quentin Ashlock would emerge four generations later as the youngest of four sons, his older brothers all destined to give their lives either in the jungles of Vietnam or in clandestine military operations carried out during the Cold War. Their deaths, along with Tristan's genetic infertility, had assured that he would be the last of Sarah's line. Such were the laws of primogeniture. Today, Colonel Ashlock was 57 years old, with thick gray hair that he still wore closely cropped to his head. His penetrating eyes were the color of steel dust, and though his facial features had begun to sag a bit, he maintained the distinguished chiseled visage of the handsome warrior he had once been. He was a veteran of both Gulf Wars, the ongoing debacle in Afghanistan, and the recipient of the DSC, the Distinguished Service Cross. Though his service career had been well distinguished as a commander of troops in the field, he had made some socially critical errors during his climb up the chain of command, errors in the form of failing to keep his mouth shut at the appropriate times and failing to kiss the butts of the appropriate generals when it would have been prudent to do so, thus giving offense in all of the wrong military circles at all of the worst times. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Blowing out six to 9,000 gallons of fuel to give a talk uh, in Florida about the dangers of global warming. He won't call the 1915 Armenian Massacre a genocide, which is a fact, while he calls weather changes, which are perfectly normal, global warming, which is not a fact because he himself is an artifact. He's an artifact of the office of the presidency. We have no idea what's going on, do we? I'm a fan of the television show called Homeland. I've watched too many episodes to think that it's all fiction. If you haven't watched it, it's really basically a simple plot. An American soldier gets captured in Iraq. He's kept uh, in captivity for seven years. He's beaten to the point where they break him. They turn him into a Muslim. They make him a double agent. They release him back into America. And this ex-American uh, soldier runs for office, and naturally he is elected because we love our war heroes. Meanwhile, he continues to pray to Mecca every day on a prayer rug in his basement, unbeknownst even to his wife and daughter. Meanwhile, he plots terrorist acts in America while he is a U.S. congressman. The one CIA agent who is on to him is convinced she is crazy, by the other members of the CIA who put her in a mental hospital and subject her to criminal uh, drugs and criminal uh, electrotherapy. Uh, but she was right. He was a double agent all along. We have double agents operating at the highest level of American government, according to people who are in the intelligence services, uh, let us say formally in the intelligence services, who see what's going on right in front of their eyes. There is no other explanation for what we're witnessing. ISIS rampaging without any American, let us say, real vociferous opposition. Bill Clinton calling ISIS a non-governmental organization and justifying what they're doing in a roundabout manner. Jeb Bush saying that NSA spying is a good thing. Do you have any idea what I'm talking with you about? It's called penetration. It's called penetration. It's called the taking over of a government from within. Not only did Bill Clinton call ISIS an NGO, legitimizing their rape, their pillaging, and their murder, but it seems that Bill Clinton was reaching out for a contract to add more money to his library. Listen to clip number one on the Savage Nation. Arguably the most interesting non-governmental organization today, which proves the importance of inclusion by its shortcomings, but is formidable, is ISIS. ISIS is a terrorist organization, an NGO, trying to become a state. That is, they don't recognize any of the boundaries of the 
Middle Eastern countries is legitimate. They were all established, drawn largely by Westerners after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in World War I. So now we have the President of the United States being a propagandist for Iran and Bill Clinton being a propagandist for the ISIS organization, legitimizing them, calling them an NGO, and saying they're simply not recognizing what the West created in the Middle East. It seems that the Clintons have no bottom to their despicable natures. It seems to me he's looking for a new contract. Listen to the next soundbite in the Savage Nation. When they go capture a place, they set up their own judicial system. They set up their own rulemaking. They set up, you know, whatever their social services are going to be. And the only thing is you can't disagree with them or they'll kill you, as we have seen. And sometimes they kill you. They will allow, just as the Ottomans did in the Caliphate times, they'll allow a Christian or a Jew to live if they agree to pay a fine. Well, that sounds like what Obama does. Obama permits Christians and Jews to live if we continue to pay the fine called exorbitant taxes. This is the most shameful generation of politicians America has ever had to live through. Obama won't call the 1915 Armenian massacre a genocide, again placating the murderous Muslims who are now dominating the West. Bill Clinton calls ISIS the most interesting NGO today. Meanwhile, a brave man wrote a letter to Obama, a Democrat, a liberal, and a Hispanic at that. His name is Ray Flores. I'll read you his letter. Dear Mr. President, he writes, a decade ago I met you when I was a writer for the Chicago Tribune's Spanish-language news daily, OI, as well as a communications specialist with the Service Employees International Union, Local 1 in Chicago. He goes on. And he said, little did I imagine that one day I would be writing an open letter to you, a man who had actually given me a recommendation for my job with the union, about your deafening silence as Christians are systematically executed by ISIS forces that some say your administration has helped fund and support. Why, Mr. President, he writes, do you stand in silence and apathy as the horrifying news reports continue to make their way to us from independent news sources on almost a daily basis? In Syria, Egypt, and Ethiopia, the pillaging of entire villages and schools has taken place, and there's not a peep from you. Entire schools of children are being set on fire. Women are being gang raped, and men are beheaded in front of video cameras for all the world to see. ISIS terrorists are mocking and laughing at us as they slaughter our Christian brothers and sisters of all ages. Are you telling me that somehow you aren't getting the same message we're getting, Mr. President? In Australia, several Catholic churches were torched and burnt to the ground. Had they been mosques, I have a feeling that there would have been some kind of official condemnation from the White House. When, Mr. President, will you come out and denounce these acts of terrorism and provide the necessary military aid to stop this genocide against Christians? In future generations, this will be seen as our generation's holocaust. And people will ask, what did President Obama do? It will be sad to say that the answer will be a resounding nothing. That is from Ray Flores, a gentleman, member of the Service Employees International Union in Chicago, and a lifetime Democrat who has more guts than the entire Republican Party put together. But if you think that you have hope with Jeb Bush, you're mistaken. In the following soundbite, you will hear Jeb Bush saying that the NSA spying is a good thing. Listen to clip three. I would say the best part of the Obama administration would be his continuance of the protections of the homeland using, you know, the big metadata programs, the NSA being enhanced, advancing this, even though he never defends it, even though he never openly admits it, there has been uh, a continuation of, of a very important service, which is the first obligation, I think, of our national government is to keep us safe. This is Jeb Bush calling for the spying on all Americans to keep us safe. It doesn't get any worse than this, does it? Yes, it does. It gets much, much worse than this. If you're foolish enough to take the bait and vote for this imposter, who, by the way, I called Barack Bush yesterday, then you don't deserve a nation. How do you feel about Jeb Bush saying that the best thing Obama has done is snooping on all America? 
with the NSA spying program. Do you feel Jeb Bush is qualified to be president? Listen to clip three again in case you were uh, not listening, in case you listen to talk shows to tell you that Jeb Bush is the best thing uh, since George Bush. Listen to clip three again. I would say the best part of the Obama administration would be his continuance of the protections of the homeland using, you know, the big metadata programs, the NSA being enhanced, advancing this, even though he never defends it, even though he never openly admits it, there has been uh, a continuation of, of a very important service, which is the first obligation, I think, of our national government is to keep us safe. Now, Hitler would have said it another way. He would have said it by screaming and yelling, and they would have played the horse vessel song behind him. But it would have been the same words of Hitler, saying that we're going to spy on all of you Germans to make sure that the communists and the Jews don't undermine the state. But when it comes from a nice American Christian, someone with a friendly, deep voice, with a fairly friendly name named Bush, why you moronic idiots called Republicans think it's just fine. But let me tell you something. Hitler is Hitler, no matter what form it comes in. Meanwhile, Christian churches are being burned to the ground. Whole families are being raped and set on fire. Christians are being driven out of the Middle East. Yazidis are being driven out of the Middle East. And this lying double agent of ours, called the president, has the audacity to go on MSNBC and says, Nah, there's less war and less violence. I'm doing a great job. I, I remind people that... Uh you know, there, there actually is probably uh, less war and less violence uh, uh, around the world today uh, than there might have been 30, 40 years ago. Um, it doesn't make it any less painful, but, uh, but things can get better. We just have to be vigilant and we have to have strong partners. I'm doing just a great job. Meanwhile, everyone who is in the military who knows better knows that he could have taken ISIS out within a week. But we're not doing that, are we? There's an actual calculation of how many impotent actions he has engaged the military in against ISIS, which is why they continue to rampage on their blitzkrieg. Do you understand that? You know what's interesting to me is that there's an article on CNN by a man who copied my line, Aaron David Miller. He says, how I ran out foxes the U.S., but he's actually ripping off one of my lines. He says, we're playing checkers on the Middle East game board, and Tehran's playing three-dimensional chess. How many times have you heard Michael Savage say that over the last few years? At least a dozen times. Is that correct? They're playing chess, and we have people who are also playing chess. This is where they got it wrong. We're not, Obama's not playing checkers against their chess. He's playing chess against the American people. Obama's playing three-dimensional chess against the American people and checkers against Iran. How do you feel about Jeb Bush sticking up for the spying on all Americans? How could you accept that? How could you accept a man saying that and claiming he's a Republican candidate? I want to shift, though, to something entirely different. A plane bound for Amman, Jordan, goes down in the Caspian Sea. The crash yields no survivors except the hijacker. And a cask containing an agent of unprecedented destructive potential is missing from the plane wreckage. A carefully plotted terrorist attack has been put into motion, and the resulting chaos might be enough to push America toward another costly war. Countdown to Mecca. It's a gripping page-turner. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. I'm going to still go to Kenya. Look, uh, it, it's a heartbreaking situation. There's a lot of uh, tumult and, and chaos around the world right now. Uh, and part of our goal as the world's leading superpower uh, is to work with partner countries uh, to try to resolve conflicts, to be ruthless in going after terrorism. Uh, but we're not going to do that by ourselves, and we're not going to do it just by deploying uh, more Marines in every country that has these problems. If we had this man in office in 1939, you would be speaking German or you would be a lampshade. Everything the man says is a lie and a cover-up. Now, I don't want to turn the whole show into Obama bashing because it's too easy to do. And we are at one minute to midnight or is it one second to midnight with the penetration and the infiltration that we all could see plainly in front of our eyes. Speaking to the issue of the uh, blitzkrieg that ISIS is conducting, almost uninterrupted by Obama. 
There's a great article in there entitled Waging JV War by Michael Fumento in today's New York Post, and it's worth reading. You see, he fought there, and here's what he wrote. As Iraqis fight to repel ISIS in Ramadi, the O administration is deeming this vital city expendable. In so doing, the White House shows it understands nothing about the value of Ramadi or even its own capacity to defend it. There's no better example of U.S. incompetence in dealing with these mad jihadis. Why isn't this key western Iraqi city, the capital of Anbai province, high on our priority list? According to Joint Chiefs of Staff Martin Dempsey, it's because President O would rather place the emphasis on defending an Anbar refinery to protect the oil supplies, as if we couldn't do both and then some. For the past eight months, the administration has settled for little more than jabs when it could have landed flurries of punishing roundhouse blows. According to the latest 24-hour Defense Department report, U.S. forces launched just 36 airstrikes against ISIS in both Iraq and Syria. That's actually much more than normal but nevertheless is the equivalent of fighter bombers from the offshore U.S. carrier making just one sortie a day, though each of these planes can fly several daily. And that doesn't count the vast numbers of ground-based F-16s, F-15s, F-22s, A-10s, B-1 heavy bombers, helicopters, and Reaper and Predator drones we have in the area, or the aircraft of 11 other coalition nations. The day before, there were only 13 airstrikes. Fewer than a single Reaper can launch on one mission. Cruise missiles are also in theater, plus B-52 and B-2 bombers can strike from anywhere in the world. Yet with this massive armada and assets on the ground to help identify targets, the administration seems unable to strike more than a handful of targets a day, a machine gun here, a truck there. There's been little effort to translate success in pinpoint assassination efforts, such as that which last month may have temporarily knocked ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi out of the fight into a war-fighting effort, which brings us back to Ramadi. A city that's no big deal, says Dempsey. Quote, it has no symbolic meaning. That's an incredible statement, he writes. The city's meaning is both symbolic and strategic. During the second Iraq war, al-Qaeda in Iraq chose the city as its headquarters, and it became the most fiercely contested area in the country. That's why the author spent two of his three Iraq embeds there. It's why SEAL Team 3 of American sniper fame was stationed there during my embeds and yet again later. That includes the first SEAL killed in Iraq, Michael Mansour, who won the Medal of Honor for diving on a grenade. Many experts consider the Battle of Ramadi and the Anbar Awakening, engineered by Captain Travis Patrick Quinn, the actual turning point of the war. Patrick Quinn, who was killed in Ramadi along with my Marine Public Affairs handler, got the Sunni chieftains to join the Americans and Iraqi security forces to defeat al-Qaeda. Now those same chieftains... And their brave men are being left to their own devices. Dempsey says that when we get around to it, we'll just take Ramadi back. Sure, like Saddam Hussein's hometown of Tikrit was retaken, one bloody meter at a time, as each trash bag, dirt mound, and corner hit an IED, and after untold numbers of the defenders were horribly murdered. In Ramadi, anybody who fought alongside us is slated for torture and death. Humanity aside, what kind of a signal are we sending potential allies? Michael Fomento concludes, Obama is keeping America's arms tied behind its back. We're no sleeping giant. We're downright comatose. I would like to say thank you to Michael Fomento, but I don't think you have it completely right. We're not comatose. We have a president who's working for the other team. That's my opinion. Savage.